Uh, this morning's meeting is Is a Rover After Your Job? And today's speaker is Martin Upchurch, who is a professor at Middlesex University. All right, thank you uh, for, the, for the introduction. Um, and I want to start just by remarking on the, 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 the number of new books and new articles and uh, in newspapers and from academics um, about uh, the rise of the robots, the onward, ever onward march of uh, the ultra-intelligent machine um, to a position of um, what's often been called techni technological singularity. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, technological singularity is the point at which machines um, essentially take over the world, that they become uh, able to write their own software, possibly even to reproduce themselves, uh, and their intelligence exceeds that of uh, the human being. And people have been fascinated by this science fiction um, sort of nirvana for uh, much longer than um, um, uh, the current uh, phase of interest in robots, uh, going back probably for uh, at least to the immediate post-war period. And the arguments are that we're moving rapidly now to a position where the prospect of technological singularity is getting ever, ever closer. Uh, um, and often quoted in this is a key report from researchers at Oxford University which came out um, three or four years ago which said, for example, that over the next two, two decades, <coughs> um, because of the increase in um, te technical um, sophistication of artificial intelligence algorithms and robotic uh, inventions, that almost half of uh, jobs in the USA would uh, disappear. And, of course, you have this scenario, therefore, uh, that um, robots are after our jobs. And we're uh, due uh, either a phase of horrific uh, technical uh, unemployment, where nobody's got a job, or at least half the population haven't got a job, or, as some have argued, um, a nirvana, uh, a, a paradise of fully automated luxury communism, where we can all enjoy uh, artistic pleasures and uh, go for nice walks with the dog or, or whatever. Uh, to our heart's content, or lay on a beach. So these are the sorts of debates that um, are, throw, are, are blowing around in the wind at the moment, uh, which I want to, to deal with. Um, and, but before I do that, I just want to go back a little bit, some historical context of these debates, before uh, focusing particularly on the issue of robots and artificial intelligence uh, and where those debates in uh, lie. And, uh, of course, apply a Marxist uh, interpretation of some of these debates. Um, the debates, in fact, ha are rehashed of, of older ones. If we look, for example, it's almost, uh, it's getting on for 100 years ago now, just round the corner here, John Maynard Keynes, living in Bloomsbury, uh, wrote a little essay um, called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. He was actually m uh, musing on the rapid spread of the telephone and how you could telephone a shop and it's, you get an order, arrive the next day, and how marvellous this was. And this was an example of modernism and a, a great leap forward in modernism. And Keynes reflected on this and he says, yes, there's going to be technical, what he called technological unemployment, that many people will lose their jobs as a result of this new modern uh, technological leap forward because it came after the telegraph um, and, 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 and the, 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 the motor car was beginning to go into mass production, so on and so forth, in the 1920s. And he said that uh, within about 80 or 90 years, round about now, we'd all only be working three days a week. Uh, and our standard of living would, 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 would have rapidly uh, advanced so that we'd all be rich and very happy. This was his vision uh, within capitalism of the power of technology. Of course, what happened... 1930s was the biggest period of unemployment, uh, led uh, into war and uh, disaster uh, for the capitalist uh, system. Um, but this obsession with, with modernism bounced back again in 1970. There was a book written by um, someone called Alvin Toffler in 1970, who was a futurologist, and he wrote a book called, uh, so-called futurologist, and he wrote a book called uh, The Future Shock, and it was very similar to the sort of predictions that Keynes made in 1928, the idea that there would be some paradise ahead of a, of, of a leisure-based society as a result of the massive increase in productivity um, that would come about by increased automation. And this, of course, was 
on the back of a new uh, wave of automation, automation linked to um, uh, computerization and the microchip, which really first came onto the market in the late 1960s. So he wrote his book in the ni- in 1970s. So he's right on, on the ball in, in, in many respects. Um, it wasn't just sort of academics or so-called futurologists. It infected many sections of the left, including trade union movements. Some of you, I can see, looking around, I would be old enough to remember Clive Jenkins of ASTMS. Uh, him, he wrote a book with his research officer, um, Predicting the Leisure Society. Um, he, he was a union leader. Clive Jenkins was a union leader uh, of uh, technical workers in manufacturing, basically. And he saw the great leap forward of automation would lead to a leisure society, again, where we'd all be able to uh, walk our dog and go on the beach and, uh, and paint pictures. Because um, the most menial work, and indeed beyond the most menial work, m- most other jobs would also be done by robots or computers. Now, what we saw... Um, since those period of the of the 1970s when those books were written was not a massive increase in productivity i've got the chart up here what you see of course is a a a massive decrease in productivity neither is it the case that there's been a massive rise uh, in uh, unemployment Um, it's certainly true that if you are in a job where a robot or uh, some form of mechanized automation is introduced you may well lose your job but in aggregates, what tends to happen, new products are created, so on and so forth. So the whole system expands, and that's been the history of technological uh, innovation um, ever since uh, capitalism uh, was born. But what it means, of course, um, is that it doesn't necessarily mean that productivity increases. And what we've seen here is with the, since the period of the microchip in the ni- late 1960s, productivity has vastly decreased across advanced industrial economies. So something is not wrong. If something has gone wrong or something is not right with the business model of automation that we find under bourgeois economics uh, and a bourgeois interpretation of the way society works. And we need to explore this as Marxists uh, to to, to have uh, some understanding of it. Now, coming up to the current time, what we find is these debates have now bounced back again. Um, uh, uh, the focus is very much on uh, robots, but it also includes this time the uh, new the, the thing that's triggered it has been digital uh, communication, in particular the internet. Um, and so we've seen a whole wave of uh, new um, uh, 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 interest in um, what might be called things like uh, the gig economy, the shared economy, um, um, platform economy. Uh, artificial intelligence, the use of algorithms, and so on and so forth. This little chart I've got behind me is just taken from, in recent years, academic citations of a few key words. The green one, if you can see the green one going up here, this is um, digital labour. So this is before 2005, and all of a sudden, the number of citations in academic journals of digital labour, and uh, if, you, if you did a, a parallel thing, I think, with newspaper articles, with journalists, you'd find something similar, a shot through the roof. Uh, similarly with the purple one, which is um, the gig economy. A gig economy wasn't a word in 2009, but all of a sudden, wham, you know, it, 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 it shoots up. So, and and the, far, the final one is platform economy. Um, which we don't hear so much about now because the, the word gig economy seems to have taken over. It's more or less the same thing. So there's a massive increase in interest, really as a result of uh, digital uh, communication. But rather than it being interpreted, and this, there, there is a difference, I think, in, in interpretation, rather than it being interpreted as uh, a, a modernist advance, something to do with modernism, in fact what we see is it being interpreted, it being interpreted as a postmodernist phenomenon? Um, that the, it's a form of a fractured society. That the old traditional uh, ways of working, for example, class relationships, including between capital and labour, are somehow disintegrated in a postmodern uh, world. This, in fact, was the position of um, Anthony Giddens, writing a few years ago, when he introduced the whole concept. Some of you might remember it, the third way. And what what he was saying about globalisation. He referred to globalisation as a product of what he called time, space, distanciation. I never say the word distanciation. In other words, that time and space were becoming increasingly compressed, and that allowed technically uh, the possibilities for global uh, production. 
He saw it as a total runaway thing. Couldn't be stopped. It couldn't be stopped. It was simply a product of the times. But in this, um, this product itself was very much a fractured, as I say, a fractured postmodernist product, which opened up all sorts of risks. And, you know, the risk society uh, became another uh, phrase that was, was bandied around in this period. It's taken up by other authors, and there's a book here by Smirnik and Williams, for example. Hart and Negri uh, talk about um, uh, the, the, the way that uh, knowledge work has usurped uh, manual or other types of work as the driver of the system. And, of course, by uh, the journalist Paul Mason, um, who refers to post-capitalism. Uh, and Paul Mason says how he defines post-capitalism it's based on an accumulation of knowledge which replaces the accumulation of capital. In other words, the old valorization process in the capital-labor relationship based on exploitation between employer and worker is now redundant uh, because work is so dispersed, so fractured, um, outside, in many cases, the control of the employer um, that, and in the control of the head, the knowledge of the individual that therefore we can begin to talk about a different type of post-capitalist society. Again, one, from quoting, Mason, quoting Mason, where there'll be unlimited wealth independent of the labour uh, expanded. Um, sort of robots making robots making robots so that humans really don't have to do anything. Again, predicting a massive increase in productivity. So there's a strand going right back to, to Maynard Keynes in 1928, the economic possibilities for our grandchildren, which keeps bubbling up every 30, 40 years, but in different ways, but essentially saying much of the same, the same things. Okay, so that's the by and large an introduction. What do Marxists say about this? Well, Marxists, of course, um, well, we always point to the contradictions and that things aren't linear, that, um, uh, that there are tensions. Um, most obviously that technology generally within the workplace is used by management as a tool uh, to increase labour productivity and to lower unit labour costs. Quite simple. Why? Because that then uh, is a tool for which they gain competition with other capitals uh, and by lowering unit labour costs uh, they can increase the rate of extraction of surplus value. But this implies a tension um, between capital uh, and labour. So it's not the case, as Marxists we would argue, that um, technology is an autonomous runaway agent. It's very much a product uh, of human agency and what people do and how people apply that technology. And there are tensions within that process. It's subject also um, to uh, uh, technical limitations, to political limitations and the economic context, which all restrain uh, and constrain um, the use of technology uh, within the workplace. Um, I'll just go back uh, a couple more of these slides. Just no, 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 more, more of these slides. The, the other thing about technology, I think, which we should understand, and again, you can't probably read this graph very well. Uh, I have got a book coming out later, which all these things have <laughs> yeah. But what this is, you can't see this. I know, but this is 1900, and this is today, 2010, 2015. And what you tend to see, and these are examples of new technology. So when we're looking at, at canes in the telephone, this is the telephone here, and it, it shoots off, and then you see things flattening out. Yeah? And then there's a reason that things flatten out, and they're often replaced by new things. There's one, one here, for example, you know, you've got HDTV, or you've got social media, you've got smartphone. But whenever you have this boom, you can almost track the sort of the excitement that the world is going to change because of this new technology. So it might have been the telephone. It might have been the credit card, you know, which is here. It might have been the colour TV. It might just have been TV. Cars, of course. The radio. Uh, and within that, um, the smartphone and the tablet, social media. But there tends to be a flattening off to, to, uh, 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 as demand is saturated uh, and as productivity from these things uh, tends to uh, decrease as a result. Um, but to move on to robots, let's get serious. Now, the reason why I think there is so much more interest in robots now is there has been a combination of new technologies which I think we also need to understand. A, a distinct interlinkage between 
the ways in which artificial intelligence uh, can um, record information and digest and use that information. So, for example, um, in terms of imaging, uh, it used to be the case that um, um, you, you know a, a robot could only uh, see and recognize see in inverted commas and recognize a few uh, images that it had been programmed to recognize. But now it's possible, again through digital technology, to scan whole loads of images and be able to um, feed that into a robot so that it, it, it has a brain, so to speak, in terms of recognising images. Let's, let's not get carried away by this, however, because all these images are initially fed in and the decision to feed in these images are fed in by human beings. There is an example of a, a robot called Beauty AI, which you may have heard of, Beauty Artificial Intelligence, which is a robot which was designed to judge beauty competitions, believe it or not. And this robot, um, when shown lots of images of women in bathing suits, only picked light-skinned women. Now, you can't argue that the robot was racist. What was clearly going on was that the people who fed in the images, either consciously or unconsciously, had only fed in images of white-skinned women and rated them 9 out of 10, 8 out of 10, as being beautiful, etc., etc. But the point is that the whole basis of algorithms and robots and robotic artificial intelligence, behind all that, there is a human agency that has actually constructed uh, these things. But, but, but in terms of the technology, what I'm saying is that it's now possible to accumulate much more image recognition, speech recognition, uh, so on and so, 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 so forth. And in terms of artificial intelligence, there has also been other examples of moving forward um, on the basis of being able to uh, uh, connect up different forms of information, so an image and a language, for example, or a piece of text. So there's undoubtedly uh, uh, leaps forward. And it's all these expert systems, speech recognition, re trying to replicate the neural networks in the human brain, for example, that what, what we mean by, by, by artificial intelligence. The second thing is the technical, sorry, is the, the declining costs. Um, and of course, this is simply to do with economies of scale, that is, uh, more robots are made um, and there's more interest in them and they're likely to get uh, cheaper. And the fourth thing, as, which fits in with this, is the algorithms, the ability to collect information as it's produced and then relay that. An algorithm is essentially a feedback loop. You know, if you're on Facebook, you know, you get some adverts thrown at you, don't you, according to, you might have sent an email on something to, to order a new camera or something and suddenly you get you know, adverts thrown. How did that happen? Well, it happens because of an algorithm. You know, some, something in your computer has recorded the fact that you sent an email uh, uh, ordering a new camera. And it pops up on your Facebook page in another form. Okay. Let's not get carried away either by the numbers of robots. Um, if we look at robotic... Uh, purchases throughout the world, or purchases of robots, not robotic purchases, purchases of robots, what you find, again, I, it's difficult for you to read this, so I interpret it, this is robot density. Um, Iran, India, Russia, Brazil, China, Indonesia, UK, France, US, Sweden, Germany, Japan, South Korea. Most robots at the moment are to be found per head of population or manufacturing uh, worker are to be found in South Korea. Just less than 500 for every 10,000 employees. And if you work that out, if there was 100 manufacturing workers in the room, in South Korea, five of them would be robots and 95 would be human beings. And that's the maximum scale. If you go to the UK, it's, 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 it's one in 100. But it's not enormous. It's not enormous. It is growing. Um, it's growing to the fact that uh, the, 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 the International Federation of Robotics for example, estimates that by, two, um, by um, over the next two years, uh, there will be one and a half million robots throughout uh, the, the world. In comparison to three billion workers worldwide, according to the International Labour Organization. Most of these robots, and I'll come to this in a moment, are now going to China. And there's distinct reasons why they're going uh, to China. Global capital investment in robots in 2015 was $600 million. It's a drop in the ocean when you compared 
to gross investment in capital equipment uh, throughout the world in, the, in 2010, just five years earlier, was $14 trillion. So it's a tiny interfissile amount of the total investment in manufacturing. Second point to, to, to make is that proportion is actually declining. There's less robots as a proportion of all investment being bought over the last few years. Uh, world robot density, we've got that one. What is a robot? Well, a robot can be more or less anything. Down the bottom here, this, these are both examples in China, you've got this poor woman sitting in a chair and she's just watching a robot. I don't quite know what it's doing. It's just, I think it's just packing one item in a, in a sort of a carrier crate, one by one. And she has to be there in case the robot breaks down or misses. And that's a robot, you know. It's enormously different from the robot here, which is essentially making a whole car or a series of robots. Again, however, note the worker watching the robots in case they broke down. They break down. Um, This isn't clear either, is it? This is the this is Chinese labour costs and robots. Robots. What? Uh, can you see this at all? Yeah. yeah. The figures. You can see the figures. The first thing to notice is the massive increase in China of robots. That's 2009. This is 2015, going up from five and a half thousand to sixty-six thousand. And remember, China's taking about half the world robots at the moment. But the interesting thing is, from, especially if you apply Marxist economics, why is this the case? Well, this is the case because Chinese labour costs are in, measured in, the, in, in, the, in Chinese currency, this is, have doubled from 31 to 60 over the same period. You know, as labour shortages take place in, 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 in you know, the industrial areas like Guangdong, there's less workers coming in from the countryside, and, and, and labour costs are rising in China quite rapidly. Industrial disputes as well. Robots, um, uh, um, uh, average selling price of the robot has gone down by about a third. So you can see that the payback period, in other words, the time you have to wait after you've invested in a robot for that robot to start making you money, if you, if you see what I mean, you know, to, to, to pay for itself, has dropped from 5.3 years uh, to one and a half years. But it's a careful balance in terms of how much investment is necessary for the robot to, to, to introduce robots compared to how much you're saving in reducing labour costs. It's not an automatic thing. It's something which is uh, which is uh, which, which is dependent on uh, other monetary factors. The second thing, however, I want to concentrate on is the technical and artificial intelligence limitations. Uh, and I'm going to refer here, so I'm, I've got to do some reality, some other stuff here. Alan Turing. Alan Turing, of course, you would have heard of, Bletchley Park, etc., etc. He was a brilliant computer scientist. And if you read his 1950 essay, if you're interested, get hold of it. You can just Google it on the internet, Alan Turing 1950 essay. It is absolutely stunning. It's not, not particularly technical. It's highly philosophical. He said there are two things, two tests, where we could say that we're approaching that element of singularity where robots are taking over the world, etc., and they're going to be after all our jobs. First test is a machine would be able to think, it, think if it could hold a conversation that was indistinguishable from one with a human being. Now, what, 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 what he meant by that, if, to try and put it simply, if you were in a pub or a cafe or something and you were talking to people and you suddenly remember a film star, for example, uh, that you both remember, or a, a piece of music that you've both heard of and you both like. And with that, you get an association. Oh, I saw that film. I saw that film in that town, in that cinema. That cinema's gone now, and I was with my friend. You know, or I heard that music when I was in love with that person, so it's very, very special to me. And you, 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 there's a back and to now, a robot. To, to get to that stage of having recall, the human consciousness is full of experience and complex interactions, bringing things in and then relaying them and learning all the time. That for a robot to do that is, 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 is a highly difficult thing. And this was, this was Turing's first test. Are we anywhere near that? No, we're not. Second test from Turing is what he called a halting problem. 
And this is, this is interesting to do with algorithms. You predict, algorithms weren't around when, when, when um, um, or, or the, the, the modern concept of algorithm wasn't around when Turing uh, was writing. But he predicted a halting problem. And the halting problem is that, a, is, is that a computer or a robot with artificial intelligence can keep computing, 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 but it never knows when it's made the right decision, when to stop. There's no way of saying to stop. That's a judgment that humans make. You know, it's like, it's like you know, painting a picture or something, or, or, or decorating your house. You know, you can go on and on and on and try and, and get it just right. Then you think, oh, that's enough, yeah? That's good enough. But a robot doesn't know that. So this is a problem, and you have to have some human influence. Third problem, outside of Turing's, is, um, is a mobility test. Um, and although there's been massive advances in robotics in terms of their ability to reach things and so on and so forth, there's still a long, long way. I'm going to illustrate this. I'm going to throw this ball at Nick, and he's going to catch it. <laughs> yes, and then he's going to throw it back to me. Right, OK. Well, that was easy, wasn't it? What sort of ball is it? A tennis ball. Would a robot necessarily recognise this as a tennis ball? Right? Because if it was a cricket ball, poor old Nick would have been going, you know, oh, catching it like that. If it was a ping pong ball, he would have been all over the place, you know, because they bounce all over the place. We know that through our own experience. You have to teach a robot that, you know. And within that, you've got very sophisticated, you know, I didn't go like that to Nick. Nick judged exactly how the flight of the ball, knowing it was a tennis ball, he immediately, without, sub unconsciously, subconsciously, consciously, reflected on the fact of the tennis ball, he knew the, the distance and he knew how far he was flying it, and he cupped his hands accordingly, vice versa. If it was a cricket ball, it would have been different, etc., etc. Now, that is easy for a human being. For a robot, that is an absolute nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare, and a long way away from the possibilities of creating robots that have that uh, level of mobility. Um, yeah. Come to that later. So these are technical constraints, and if you like, um, technological uh, constraints uh, and consciousness constraints on the developments of artificial intelligence and robots. What about the evidence? What about the evidence of productivity? Because don't forget that Paul Mason's book and some of the others, um, Hart and Negri, uh, Srinik and Williams, which is on here, are predicting this possibility of fully automated luxury. Uh, communism. Um, well, based on increasing productivity as a result of automation. Well, the evidence is uh, that um, a very good piece of work uh, by Michaels and Greats from a data set of companies in 17 countries gathered between 1993 and 2007, so it's recent data, they were looking at productivity increases with robotic innovation um, where some semi-skilled and lower skilled jobs were abandoned. Uh, and their conclusions was there is some evidence of diminishing marginal returns to robot use. There are congestion effects. And that first graph I put up was an example in de demand terms of what's so-called congestion effects. They are not a panacea for growth. This makes robots' contribution to the aggregate economy roughly on a par with previous important technologies, some of which I put up there, such as railroads in the 19th century and the US highways in the 20th century. And indeed, there's... Um, um, an American academic, Robert J. Gordon, who's uh, done lots of work on various technologies in the American economy, who comes to very similar conclusions uh, 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 and argues that things such as urban sanitation uh, were probably just as important in developing uh, capitalism and increasing productivity as um, computerized automation or indeed robotics. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, in 2016 in a major review, said the introduction of new technologies is a slow process due to economic, legal and societal hurdles, so that technological substitution often does not take place as expected. Um, an example of this is so-called driverless or autonomous cars, um, where there's a lot of excitement around at the moment, but the problem with driver and, uh, and, uh, driverless cars is not so much a technical problem, it may well be a demand problem that people don't want a driverless car, you know, they'd rather have their own lovely piece of equipment that they park outside and so on and so forth. But really it's actually um, a, a sort of 
a, a, a legal societal problem is that who's going to insure uh, and the insurance companies are saying we're not going to insure any driverless cars because we want somebody, a human being, to be responsible in case there's an accident. Uh, and so th this hurdle is unlikely uh, to be breached in the immediate uh, future. So the technology may be there, but the, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is the sociology uh, doesn't necessarily um, mean that it's going to work. Uh, and the last piece of evidence I'm going to present, because I've got five uh, minutes left, is that of this example of singularity. Are we or are we not moving to a position of singularity? That point in time, technological singularity, at which humans become redundant because uh, machines and robots and artificial intelligence have taken over all production. Now... A very good analysis of this is done by uh, an economist at Yale University called Nordhaus. And what he did, the only way he could, you could test this, there are two ways to test if we're getting near, uh, getting near singularity. One way is if there's accelerating demand for the new technology. In other words, instead of that graph I showed where there's a flattening demand, it kept going on, onwards and onwards and onwards. You know, so the whole of the world population... Everybody wanted every single piece of new technology that comes out immediately. That's 100% accelerating demand. The second is whether there's 100% accelerating supply. In other words, that these things could be made, and they are being made, etc., etc. Now, with a, with, with a combination of two, 100% accelerating demand and 100% accelerating supply, you could argue that sing singularity is possibly near. Actually, when you look at the, the figures and the tests of these uh, two uh, opposite scenarios, what you find is that variables such as wages, productivity pro growth, prices, intellectual property, products and research and development, of these issues, f on five of those seven tests or issues, the likelihood of singularity proved negative. In other words, we're going backwards in terms of things such as productivity, which I've already put the, 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 the figures on. Um, uh, uh, but also rising, rising wage growth, because, because to have accelerating demand, you have to accelerate in real wages. And actually, real wages have been in, de in decline. So in other words, even if the stuff was being made, it couldn't be bought, because people haven't got um, the disposable income to do that. So, so, so it failed most of these tests, these economic tests, uh, indicating that singularity, if it did occur at all, would be at least 100 years away. But, um, and as I've said with Maynard Keynes in 1928, we're almost up to his 100-year uh, prediction of uh, working three hours a week, and we're nowhere near, uh, 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 near that as it happens. OK, some final conclusions. Oops. Some tentative conclusions. Now, I'm not arguing... I'm not arguing that... A robot isn't after your job. In some cases, you will have a robot after your job. That's absolutely clear, because that's the way capitalism works. In the same way as dockers in the east end of London, in the 1970s, uh, robots were after their job in the form of containers. You know, big container ships with art. You know, dockers used to physically haul the sacks off the ships in the docks in the port of London. They don't now, because container ships were built moved down to the deep water uh, port further down towards Tilbury. In a decade, 170,000 dockers lost their jobs in East London. It's quite astonishing. Same with printers at Wapping. I was at the, you know, outside the Wapping works as Murdoch was introducing um, uh, digital-based journalism and getting rid of hot metal uh, printing. Those people lost their jobs. Absolutely. So I'm not arguing that technology or robots means that some people won't lose their jobs. But in the aggregate, it's not the case that that experience is repeated all across the economy. In actual fact, what tends to happen, it releases new jobs, new production processes, so on and so forth, and, and, and is the dynamic of capitalist uh, growth. And the evidence is not historical. There's no historical evidence, and there's certainly no contemporary evidence uh, that there's mass unemployment as a result of automation in aggregate. However... Other things which we need to remember. Robots remain machines, and you should read Michael Roberts, who's much better at explaining than I can, on, on, on how robots uh, remain machines and are subject to laws of value. Until a robot can actually breed other robots, a robot is still 
a piece of constant, it's still a piece of dead capital, you know? It's still a machine that's been made by humans in the past, maybe with the aid of robots, but until they can breed, they're still subject to the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, you know, as the, as the organic composition of capital rises. They're still machines, they're still machines, and we must, we must remember that. Secondly, labour productivity increases initially, that's why capitalists invest, but then tends to level off. So the rate of return on capital outlay diminishes over time, and labour resistance is possible in this situation. So we must never forget that either. Third, the investment in automation is actually declining, particularly since the financial crash. So all these books, some of which you've got here, predicting you know, the rise of the robots and increasing in investment, actually need to be revised. They need a, they need a, they need a last chapter rewritten. So actually, no, no, you know, it's going the other way, it's a reversing trend. Technical limitations persist at the level of mobility and flexibility. Remember the tennis ball. Supply and demand are constrained by economic sociology. So remember things like insurance for driverless cars. And the ultra-intelligent machine, written in 1965 by John Good, that will surpass all the intellectual activities of man, however clever, so that the intelligence of man will be left far behind, singularity, uh, remains remote, in fact, very remote. And the dream of singularity would be faced also with a simultaneous collapse of the underlying dynamic of capitalism. Because if all these things were reversed, if they were all going into positive and we were moving towards a robotic, a totally robotic future, that would mean huge industrial unrest as work, you know, we, <laughs> that's what it's all about, isn't it? That's why we're here. You know, it's, it, it would mean huge industrial unrest and resistance. And anyway, and if, if the capitalists won, the only surviving human, I'm just starts musing here, the only surviving human industrial sectors might be defence and space exploration to guard against terrorist or foreign hostile cyber attack and against attack on humans by super intelligent machines. And that's really, I suppose, the science fi fiction future which excites people but really isn't based in very much evidence at all. Okay.